Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Debwe, one of the psychiatrists at MIT Student Mental Health. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about the alert systems that we have in our brains, the sorts of behaviors and feelings that they can bring up, and how they might be activated in all of us during this very unusual situation with COVID-19. Just an obligatory public service announcement, other than the fact that I'm maybe going to be able to advance these slides and maybe not, um, is that I tend to use metaphors from science fiction and fantasy when I give talks about um, psychology, psychiatry, and neuroscience. Um, it's one of the things that I like about working at MIT, that students tend to get that. Um, but you know, the workings of the human mind are mysterious and sometimes even seem to be magical. And so science fiction and fantasy give a lot of ready metaphors to try to explain and, um, you know, illustrate the kinds of things that happen to us on a daily basis that we might not readily comprehend. Um, I like to tell students when I give talks and show this slide that we can imagine that here's a graduate student talking to her psychiatrist, not me, um, about you know the last six months of her thesis and how she doesn't know whether to go with the head of her committee or her research mentor as to the direction of her work. And they're arguing with each other a lot. She has a sense that one of them may actually not even be giving her the most scientifically rigorous advice and the psychiatrist, knowing she's a fan of Star Wars, might decide to distance her from her situation for a moment by saying, you know, that reminds me actually of that part of episode three where Anakin Skywalker is watching Mace Windu and Chancellor Palpatine duel, and it's not clear to him either, um, you know, who's the good guy, who's in the right, who has his best interests in mind. It's natural to struggle with it. And then the student identify with that and having thought for a moment about something that isn't directly her life, that she's all mixed up in, it might actually help her process it in session. And by the same token, I, I like to illustrate some of the workings of the human mind, as I said, that are equally baffling and mysterious and even sometimes intimidating to us by using, you know, themes and watchwords from, from shows and, and stories that we know. Because MIT just sometimes feels like one struggle after another, from beginning to end. Uh, even before we finish fixing one problem, another one can crop up. And now we have a new problem. We're all sitting at home, in, sheltering in place, and feeling nervous about it, which is kind of weird if you think about it, because we spend a lot of time, faculty, staff, students, a lot of our time at MIT and at home while we're working and studying at MIT is sitting and looking at a computer. So how did sitting and looking at a computer become so hard? Why is it anxiety provoking now? To understand that, we have to understand the very old uh, alert systems of our brain that we share with nearly all other vertebrates and the behaviors and emotions that they can bring up as part of the instinctual responses that they use to deal with threat. And hopefully, in the course of the talk, by explaining a little bit more about this to you, we can figure out what each of us might do with these instinctual responses. Our brain's alert system is very old, as I said, and it's not nuanced. It's mainly situated in the brainstem, which despite what the faculty, staff, and students at MIT might want to be true, we still have a brainstem. We're not just all cerebral cortex. Um, it's like the red alert system on a starship. You know, it flashes when there's dire threat, um, but it doesn't give any information about that threat. And, and the cerebral cortex gets very little input into the activation of that alert system. So it could be a tiger, it could be a coyote, it could be your orals, um, it could be the 801 exam, it doesn't matter. If it's seen as something that's intimidating, it's seen as something that's perilous. There is no difference made by the brainstem between the two. And what it does is it activates a response that is summarized by some as the fight or flight response. And that's because in human beings, this is, these are the two responses that are most commonly seen. Uh, the threat appears and you either hulk out or you make like the flash and book it out of there. Um, and, you know, evolutionarily speaking, this is pretty advantageous, right? You do not want a tiger to appear and for you to be like, gee, what would be the most elegant and 
nuanced stone tool that I could fashion to deal with this predator. You want to either pick up the nearest rock to you and throw it, or find the quickest way out of there, or even just the first way out of there that you can see and take it. And to mount that fight or flight response, there are physical changes. And as a result of mounting the fight or flight response, there are emotional changes. There's a burst of energy to give us an almost preternatural ability to fight the threat or evade it. But immediately afterwards, energy goes way down. We've eaten up lots of energy stores, uh, a little bit actually like a flash. Um, and when we are repeatedly having this alert response mount itself, we become easily fatigued, chronically fatigued. We just don't have the energy to do our normal activities, or it seems that way. And because there's often fleeing as the response to this, we've evolved to have as part of the response our gut speeding up so that the means by which that tiger might track us are left at the site of meeting them in a neat little pile, and they can't continue to trail us easily. However, in modern life, this translates either into repeatedly going to the bathroom, which at best is a minor inconvenience, and at worst is really disruptive to getting anything done, or our gut just aches. We might not be hungry, even though our energy is really low. Our muscles might ache, our joints might even ache, because we feel the need to act, and yet we're told and are observing the need to sit. Our heart speeds up in preparation for the physical changes. Our breathing speeds up in preparation for fighting or fleeing. And that can be really disquieting now when we're dealing with an invisible or not easily visible threat who manifests most commonly as respiratory symptoms. The idea that we're not getting enough air can be even more anxiety provoking and, and pile on top of the worry that we already have. And these proto emotions of irritability and fear to fight or flee, they get translated by our brain, by our higher brain in all sorts of ways, a sadness, depression, demoralization, worry, confusion, anxiety, sensitivity, panic attacks, anger, we might not even notice our emotional changes. It might be our friends that notice them. It might be our lab mates that notice them. When we're talking to them on Zoom, when we're texting back to them, when we're not communicating with them. And as always, this alert system makes us feel like we need to get out of a place if we can't destroy the threat. And of course, again, with an invisible threat, how do we know that we destroyed it? So fighting is pointless. It's besides the point. And fleeing eventually takes over, but we've been told to stay in place, to not run through the streets randomly, looking for safety, changing location. And it also occurs, you know, during quote unquote normal MIT life. You know, when the alert system goes off for an 801 exam, you feel like you need to leave the room where it's being administered. And that translates into rushing through the exam and handing it back in and getting out of there. And with a PSET, well, the PSET's not going anywhere at least not until it's due, and even then it's not going anywhere if you don't do it on time. So then you end up avoiding it in order to flee it. And that actually brings in a third alert response. It's less often seen easily in humans, but it often plays a role. And that's the response that we see in herbivores. Um, you may have seen it when you've been driving along a country road and a deer gets caught in your headlights, and that's to freeze. And again, you know, for deer, for most of their existence on planet Earth, freezing, very functional response to a threat. Pack of wolves comes by, deer freezes, blends into the background. If the wolf pack doesn't smell the deer, the wolf pack keeps going, the deer is safe. But relatively recently, evolutionarily speaking, humans invented cars, they invented headlights, and suddenly the deer freezing is a counterproductive response to a threat. And unfortunately, freezing, which gets translated most often into a form of avoidance, is also counterproductive for people a lot of the time in their modern life. Rather than taking five from a friend who seemingly is annoying us, possibly as part of our irritability from the fight response, we treat them poorly. We hulk out in response to them. Or we do take five, but five becomes 10, and then that becomes a day, and then that becomes a week, and all of a sudden, now it's not just that friend, but you're also not responding to the Zoom invites from your fr friend group. You're not responding to the Zoom invites from your lab group. You're not showing up for virtual lecture. You're not showing up for virtual office hours. You have dropped out of sight. 
because that feeling of threat is suddenly getting broadly applied to being in contact with anyone or anything. And that loss of moderation can also be seen when avoidance, when freezing, comes into conflict with fleeing. And we turn to things that might seem to dull the stress response. Exercise, comfort food, drinking, animal crossing, and some of these things in moderation might actually be a really good stress relief technique. But when you're on the Peloton all day, or when you're drinking all day, or when you're staying away from everyone and doing no work and just meditating, so to speak, marinating in your fear, that makes the problem worse. And before long, it fails to dull the stress response either. As I say to students before this crisis, if a tiger appears, you wouldn't stay on Reddit all day, even if you normally found reading an article or two to be calming. You've got to actually deal with a threat if a threat is there. So how do we do that? Well, one way, now that we've talked a little bit about the fight or flight response, freezing, the alert systems, the instincts, is to recognize them, to remember what I've been talking about here, and then to say, okay, I know what's happening here, and now I'm gonna to try to utilize it. So you notice your muscles are sore, you have anxious energy, you grab a mask, and you go out for a walk, and you work off some of that energy. As I tell students in the video chats that I've been doing with them lately, the air itself is not poisonous. You're just supposed to be social distancing and taking proper precautions. And if you get out onto the street and now it's more crowded than you expected, and again, that feeling of panic is coming back, you acknowledge that this time there may actually be a rational reason for it to some extent, and you carefully cross to the other side. Or if you've been walking around for a while, you decide that this is the point at which you're going to head home and see if you can resume your work. If the news briefing is now making you want to hulk out in anger, if it's making you nervous, turn it off. The data will still be there later this afternoon. And if the governmental briefing that makes you want to hulk out is the one that I think it is, well, there's going to be a YouTube video of it later, no doubt. If you feel like your friends are aggravating you, your lab mates are really disappointing you to the point of wanting to turn green, let them know how much they mean to you after you've taken five, just five, and when you're ready to talk to them again, you acknowledge that, you know, they probably wouldn't annoy you that much if they weren't so important to you. That's gonna mean a lot to them, and it's gonna mean a lot to your own bond to them to express it out loud. Now, I'm making this sound really simple, and you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, well, great. Now that I have recognized exactly what is happening, you want me to be like somebody from the planet Vulcan and just use logic. No, not at all. Again, we all have brain cells. We're all struggling with these kinds of feelings and behaviors right now. Every one of us, even me. So we have to also utilize tools for calm, ones that are functional and that, again, if we use them in moderation, they can be helpful. Not just dulling the stress response, but giving us the space for our cerebral cortex to have a moment to kick in. My colleagues have lots of good suggestions on these podcasts and videos for calming techniques. I'm just going to talk about one of them, mindful observation. It's an exercise to try to better perceive things as they really are, to be able to tell the difference between a tiger and something that just feels as fear-inducing as a tiger would. You focus in on one aspect of the scenery for five minutes every day, and as you begin to practice it every day, you can expand that to five minutes twice a day, 10 minutes twice a day, and so forth. And you got to do it without judgment. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, we're really good hypothesis generating machines as human beings, and particularly the human beings who get selected to work and study at MIT. We're good at making second order, third order, fourth order hypotheses and guesses as to what might be true based on the data that we have. And it ends up kicking in all the time. For our work, it's kind of a skill that's helpful. When our emotions hijack our higher order thinking, when the alert system is in full force, it is not helpful because what we're coming up with are anxious or angry distortions. So you might look at how many limbs of the tree outside your window have buds on them, how many cars on the street outside are red, but you're not counting them. You're not trying to say, oh, I think spring is coming late this year. 
When you notice yourself doing that, or when you notice your anxious thoughts returning, you remind yourself that this exercise is just five minutes of your day. And that when that five minutes are done, you will have plenty of time to worry, to brood, to think about whether or not spring is coming late this year. The idea is to connect the primary sensory uh, regions of your cerebral cortex more intimately to the fundamental parts of your frontal cortex, that you're reconnecting what you can apprehend with your basic planning. This takes time. Neural processes don't happen overnight. They require repeated firing along the same lines in order to wire together. And more frustratingly, even after you've become a little bit more practiced at it, and it occurs to you as part of the background thinking when you have that split second moment after the initial panic, it still doesn't work every day or in every situation. Sometimes the emotions are just so overwhelming that you're gonna end up poking out or flashing away anyway. But maybe it kicks in after that behavior starts. Maybe it kicks in after you've noticed some of the physical changes. The key is, is to keep at it. And it's a lifelong practice and it does get to be more helpful over time. And again, my colleagues have lots of other good suggestions if this particular one of mindful observation doesn't work for you. I'd like to close with just a couple of numbers of who to call for additional support in dealing with stresses in general and particularly stresses at this time. Um, getting in touch with my colleagues on access is pretty much the same as it would be even before the COVID situation. 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. you can call 617-253-2916 and one of the front desk staff uh, working remotely uh, will get in touch with one of the access providers for that day. We'll call you back and figure out with you after chatting with you for a bit to get you the support that you need, including for those of you who are not still in the Boston, Cambridge area, including referrals to a local provider where you are. And if it's an issue that can't wait at all, by all means, call 617-253-4481, day or night. That's the urgent care number. It will either connect you to one of my colleagues on call or to the front desk staff at Urgent Care who will then connect you with one of my colleagues on call. Emergent issues, as always, call 911 or your local police wherever you are right now. If you still are on the MIT campus, that police number is 617-253-1212. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, and I'll see you soon when we all return to campus.